Identifying beneficial owners, a basic overview. Within this video, we'll look at what is a beneficial owner after an introduction, the risks of uncertain information on beneficial owners to your organization, and complex corporate structures and how to decipher them or how to see through them. Okay, so let's go into the introduction. Every loan or financial agreement is an exercise in risk management by the financial institution. Now, risk management by financial institutions is a bit of a necessary for the continued health of a global economy. Businesses require capital in order to start up and expand, much of which is drawn up from lending from financial institutions. We all rely on financial institutions for mortgages on houses, income from investments with banking stock securing in our pensions, national treasures benefit from taxation, bank profits, obviously when not bailing them out. It doesn't stop there. Even when buying a car, 90% of car owners bought their car via loan agreements last year. It is just common practice in this day and age to lease or create a personal contract purchase of a car with a balloon payment in the end, should you choose to take ownership of the vehicle, or what most people do is change it for a newer vehicle. So it's become second nature, a Granger financial agreement or Ranger lease. Therefore, it is within the public's interest that banks and other financial institutions take these risks. But such risks should be taken with responsibility of taking ownership of these risks. We have all witnessed what happens when risks are taken without the responsibility. That's why I've labelled this taking responsibility. There's an obvious risk versus reward mentality as well. And this mentality seems to sneak in somehow and profit-focused individuals lose sight of the bigger picture and all of a sudden develop a very short-term memory that only stops to their next bonus or promotion, whichever comes first. So please keep this in mind when carrying out your risk management processes. When the OECD reviewed 400 plus bribery cases across 41 countries for its 2014 report, analysis of the crime of bribery of foreign public officials, it found that one in four of them had involved illicit money channeled through shadowy secret companies. The World Bank has estimated that corporate politicians use secret companies to obscure their identities in 70% or more than 200 cases of grand corruption. The New York Times reported in 2014 that an estimated 8%, you're talking more than 7 trillion US dollars of the world's personal finance wealth is held in undeclared offshore deposits. Opportunities to illicitly transfer or hide money through complex networks of companies deliberately created to mask details of ultimate beneficiaries have been a central part of two of the most high profile corruption scandals in recent years. The alleged bribery among representatives of football world governing body FIFA and the allegations of political kickbacks involving the Brazilian energy giant Petrobras. Of course, the leak of 11.5 million files from the database of Panama-based law firm Mosaic Fonseca in April 2016 has further highlighted the challenges due diligence teams face today. Measures have been taken against hidden beneficial ownership in many individual jurisdictions, but the extent of the problem demonstrates in the importance of all nations working together to align with a consistent approach. So there's a heavy focus now from the regulators to organisations such as yourselves, the financial institutions, as well as due diligence teams, compliance officers, anti-financial crime teams, to look at behaviour, whether you are taking that responsibility, whether you are carrying out your investigations to that end point, or are you simply relying on some document to tick a box. No longer do we require people with tick box mentalities. We now require them to be far more effective. As I said before, such risk taking creates two further, albeit under advertised offences. The role of industry in laundering the proceeds of crime and the role of industry in the facilitation of crime itself. Extreme risk taking along with other damaging activities such as product mis-selling and rate fixing have dominated the media 
and dinner party conversations. Whilst money laundering and associated facilitation of criminal activity by financial institutions remain overlooked, possibly due to lack of understanding or the average person's assumption that it is something for the regulators and the police rather than their problem. We forget the taxpayers footing the bill racked up in the billions by a few irresponsible greedy people given the power to freely roam around and play with hard-working individuals' financial lives, which includes pensions and mortgages, etc. So how do we start challenging an institutionally profit-focused organisation into a customer-focused one? So the tick-box mentality leads to fines and imprisonment. Someone else's responsibility is no longer true. A lot of people say, I don't get paid enough for that level of detail. Unfortunately, in that case, you're in the wrong job. And if you do your job well, you will eventually get paid enough. Not my job. This silo mentality is not the case anymore. You are an organization and at least I would expect you to act as an organization. I have no time for this, these target things. Then you go to your management and let them understand how you are carrying out your investigations. First things first, attitude is the first step to betterment. All those tick box mentalities, not my job, don't have time, they're all false excuses when it comes to attitude. You have to have the right attitude to carry out. Otherwise, your organization will find someone who does. What is a beneficial owner? Well, let's start with who is a beneficial owner. According to the FATF, beneficial owner refers to a natural person who ultimately owns and controls a customer and or the natural person whose behalf a transaction is being conducted. It also includes a person who exercise ultimate effective control over a legal person or an arrangement. Why do these beneficial owners use corporate vehicles? Well, first things first, it's an attractive way to disguise proceeds of crime. Is a great way to convert the proceeds of crime as well. Take this for example. There's an organisation where human trafficking, the average robbing on the street, stealing, funding of terrorism, dealing of drugs, gathering a lot of cash. So this cash then goes into a company, a cash intensive business, and that cash intensive business generated through false invoices goes to a bank, and then the bank account then produces legitimised cash to which bitcoins are being purchased and that bitcoin is then used to fund human trafficking and terrorism and the cycle goes round and round. Corporate vehicles are an attractive way to disguise and convert the proceeds of crime before introducing them into the financial system. The evolved criminal today no longer looks at a short term level. He or she looks far more long term than you and I would like to think. So therefore, they try to do the three breaks. Break the crime from themselves. Therefore, they disassociate themselves from the crime. They carry out a break between the money, you know, criminal proceeds. And third break is their link to the proceeds as a result of the crime. Let's look into this in a little more detail for you to gain a deeper understanding on how he or she achieves this. Okay, so you have these three breaks which I've dotted down. Now, instead of committing the fraud in his own name, the fraudster incorporates a company administered and controlled by a law firm on his behalf. Now emails are sent by the fraudster to the victim via the company. By utilizing a, a company, the fraudster significantly reduces the chances of being detected because the fraudulent activity is less likely to appear suspicious when transacted by a company other than any individual. It is the financial crime equivalent of a burglar taking the precaution of putting on gloves so as to not to leave any fingerprints at the crime scene. Even if the emails are identified as suspicious, his connection to the company needs to be established in order for the involvement in the fraud to be revealed. So let's look at break two. As an alternative to placing money gained from, from any crime, such as fraud under the mattress, the fraudster then arranges for the company which he controls to open a bank account and brokerage account into which money then is transferred. The fraudster then transforms the proceeds of their original form of cash into a yacht, usually within the Mediterranean harbour through a series of share and currency transactions. Now let's look at break three. The fraudster is clever enough to know 
that he should not risk owning the yacht in his name. Recognising the risk that the fraudster could be connected to the fraud through the yacht if it were ever to be traced back to the crime. He instead owns the yacht through a trust. It's not just a trust directly linked to the yacht. This trust is administered on his behalf by a priv private bank owned company. The trustees in turn own a company which acts as a legal registered owner of the yacht. In this way, the fraudster's connection with the yacht is disguised but he gets to enjoy the proceeds of crime. This evolved process of money laundering allows the individual to evade being identified. Many due diligence teams would carry out due diligence of the fraudster's firm up until the law firm, but with the new regulatory requirements which include the onboarding teams to carry out a deeper level of due diligence will require you to do your utmost to find the ultimate beneficial owner lurking behind the veil of secrecy. The risks of uncertain information on beneficial owners. This is by no means an exhaustive list of things that can happen, but for now, this will be sufficient to remind you of the consequences. But first things first, criminals get away with their crime. Secondly, your financial institution is used to launder money. Thirdly, it's used to for terrorist financing. Fourth, your department can become subject to a regulatory investigation. Fifth, your organisation could be fined and served with a Section 166 order. This is generally to investigate and evaluate any issues the regulator has identified within the firm following a visit. A Section 166 or S166 is usually a supervisory order for inappropriate systems and controls. Basically, you let a criminal use your organisation to either launder money or fund terrorism and your processes were inadequate to pick up on this, even monitoring. Let's look at a couple of examples. Imagine a drug trafficking organization in America selling drugs to street dealers in exchange for cash. The cash is accumulated in safe houses or it is collected by associates. These associates place the cash into cash intensive businesses like nightclubs, restaurants, taxi firms, casinos, nail parlors, etc. It seems to come from these legitimate businesses. By in actual fact, the money is directly from the drug dealing organization. And indeed, these cash intensive businesses take a generous fee for this money muling exercise. They then individually deposit batches of up to $9,999 in numerous bank accounts. The reason why 9999 10000 or higher, the bank has to report or is obliged to report it to the FinCEN with the, the American regulators. Therefore, it stays under the radar, so to speak. Once these sums are deposited in individual bank accounts with non-affiliated financial institutions, the money is then wired to an account of an offshore company where it is used to purchase stocks and bonds. The securities are subsequently sold and the money is transferred into the account of another company under the cover of a loan, where it is eventually used to pay the company under the credit card bills of the wife of a senior member of the trafficking organization, who often has difficulty resisting the temptations of designer boutiques in Paris or Milan. That senior member of the drug trafficking company is in this case your ultimate beneficial owner. But you would have to look into other beneficial owners whosoever passes your due diligence. Naturally these beneficial owners require bank account openings so their accounts are going to be monitored and it is up to you to monitor and collect or red flag anything that you feel is inappropriate. A corrupt politician wants to establish a corporate vehicle in which to park a bribe. He sets up a front company in order to disguise and control his beneficial ownership. More so as he doesn't want his politician status flagged to the bank as it will place his financial transactions in higher scrutiny. The front company's bank account receives a 10 million bribe by way of wire transfer. The money remains in the same bank account and is used as collateral to purchase a property in Mayfair. Now this property is used for his occasional trips in UK. 
Although in example one earlier, you could see the layering and the money mules you being used. But in this example, there is no recognizable placement activity as the proceeds of the bribe has already legitimately been present before being wired to the front company. Layering is far more difficult to identify because the proceeds of the bribe remain passive in the account, acting only as collateral. Furthermore, there is no obvious integration as the money does not move but is solely used as, as security for a loan. In such cases, regulators have investigated banking systems and controls when they have established the front company as being used by the politician when the purchase company was scrutinised under the Criminal Finances Bill and presented with an unexplained wealth order. I believe no one can predict what actions regulators will take as the threshold seems to change during each and every investigative angle. But one thing is for certain. If you miss anything, then the subject of scrutiny by the organisation is you who is opening the account. So please keep this in mind. Let's look at complex corporate structures. One of the most challenging tasks for due diligence teams when carrying out their CDD investigation are two things. One, customers' connections to money laundering, bribery, corruption and terrorism. Two, to uncover the identities of the ultimate beneficial owners of entities, properties and third party business partners. Things are now evolving. Along with technological advances, there have also been advances in products and services offered by financial institutions that are tailor-made for specific clients. It was through these complex specified products that gave birth to the CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, one of the causes of the 2008 financial crisis. Along with technology comes complexity. As corporate structures changed, understanding a customer's business is no longer black and white. There is a huge gray area that experienced due diligence officers have to investigate and navigate around complex corporate structures. The problem has been exasperated by independent companies willing to place layers of corporate levels between the beneficial owner or owners and their companies as a paid service. These complex ownership trails cross geographical and legal boundaries, allowing criminals to obscure the real identities of the people who ultimately benefit from the financial transactions. You get organizational structures like this to this. Usually due diligence team compliance officers will classify their due diligence investigation to be completed at the trusts due to their geographical locations and countries secrecy laws. But this alone should ring alarm bells to you. You should question the levels of corporate structures and why a company would want to make it so complicated over a number of jurisdictions, etc. For such a complex structure as this should create a red flag. Do not take the customer's word for anything. Remember, these liaison personals are paid to liaise with and befriend you, more so for the RMs. If you fail to see through the complexity, then you should be questioning your role within the organisation. Money laundering has evolved. It is no longer a matter of placement layering and integration where the assumption is that criminal property is placed into the financial system. That used to be the case for many years and how police officers within financial investigation units such as myself would catch the criminal some 20 years ago. But things have now evolved. It is this lack of understanding the criminal mind has led compliance officers and due diligence teams to inadvertently slip into a tick box mentality. If compliance officers and due diligence teams are to carry out their roles properly, they would need to understand the criminal. And to understand the criminal, they would have to understand the criminal mind, how it evolves and seeks ways to bypass the regulatory threshold. Their way of thinking starts off as a very simple goal, split into four quadrants, if you will. First, to commit the crime. Second, to get away with the crime without any detection. Thirdly, to distance oneself from the evidential link. This includes the proceeds as well. They still want to enjoy the proceeds of crime and therefore will try and circumvent any way they can the regulatory requirements or regulatory function. 